Hello, yes. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a very big fan. I have, I spent the last week or so binging your solo snooker podcast. So. Oh, good. Nice to meet the man behind the queue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess the first thing is, so you started, um, you started doing your comedy podcast quite a long time ago, actually, around a decade ago now, which is really yeah. before it hit the mainstream. And now, yeah. now, you know, you've got your, well, you've got several podcasts such as the Solo Snuka one, which is my personal favourite, but your good, good, good Rah- is, yeah. is one of the biggest um, comedy podcasts in the UK now. So when you sure. first started doing it, was it, did you think that like podcasting and your podcast in particular would become big as, as they have now, or was it just something you kind of enjoyed doing? Uh, well, when we I started like 12 years ago, because I did a podcast called Collins and Herring, uh, which was me and Andrew Collins, and we swapped a G around in our names for some reason. Um, and it was really, uh, it wasn't really thinking anything was going to come of it particularly. I think we just realised, we'd done a radio show together and that had been cancelled and we kind of thought um, maybe if we did this podcast, maybe the radio might listen and put us back on. But also I, I just felt like it seemed so easy to do and we thought, why not give it a go? But I immediately just liked the autonomy of it and um, I wasn't interested in it. because you know, It didn't seem like a way of making money or really getting anywhere. It just seemed like a fun thing to do. But also I, I was trying to get so many projects off the ground and it was so difficult. So the idea of just someone turning up at my house, I was recording something and putting it online immediately was just massively appealing to me and being able to swear. And so, you know, to begin with, we were some of the more, you know, as it occurs to me and Collins and Herring, we kind of, I kind of pushed the envelope because you're able to, but then you kind of sort of start to get bored with being allowed to do that. So you do kind of come, come down to a sort of bigger level. But yeah, the freedom and the autonomy were the main thing within a year or so of doing the the Collins and Herring I kind of realized it was you know having an effect on the numbers of people who come to see my my gigs so I was a stand-up comedian and that was my way I was making money but not that many people come to see me you know sort of 50 100 sometimes 200 but within about a year or two of starting I noticed those numbers were now 60 100 you know 300 and it was so just by being in people's and at the time there was very little competition in podcasts there was a very few podcasts so by being in people's homes every week and then you know, they you know they had to invite you in as well which i really like about podcasts so it's it's not the same deal as a radio or tv show where you're being broadcast into someone's house and you can offend them they have to choose if they don't like it or if they're bored by it as most people are by the snooker then they won't <laughs> they won't listen to it um and so you know that i just realized um that there was a lot of scope, I felt, artistically speaking, more than anything else. And I couldn't really see any way of making it work as a financial model beyond it suddenly meaning I could sell a few more books or a few more DVDs or a few more tickets to shows. Um, and then, yeah, you know, as it's gone on, I just, it's, it wasn't something I thought, oh, I'll be doing this in 12 years time still. And this, I'd never thought this will be my main job, which it sort of is now. Um, I thought it was a way of, you know, keeping people interested. We did get a radio show in the end uh, with me and Andrew, so that did work. Uh, and it did lead to some other TV jobs and other jobs down the line. So it felt like, okay, well, that's what this is for. And then just, you know, I, I, it's always, I've always been slightly frustrated getting stuff made and working hard on stuff or, and then someone comes along who doesn't understand it or the person who liked it leaves. It takes so long. So just, I, I sort of saw the potential for just being able to do weirder stuff. So the snooker thing I've been doing is probably longer than Rahalista, but I think slightly it's so I just thought that's something you could never do anywhere else in the world other than on the internet to people who were <laughs> interested in Weirdos, it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not you know, I, with the joke with it was I was trying to lose, I was doing something deliberately boring um, and, and incomprehensible, really, because it was an audio frame of snooker and I'm not good at snooker and, or describing snooker. So the idea was to see if I could lose every single listener. Yeah. But there's something more to it. It's a, you know, it's an artistic project, really, and it has been it's featured in a festival of transgressive art, along with people do, doing the horrible things to their genitals. <laughs> and me, you know, being sort of tedious... Yeah. But I was also fascinated with that one, by the way, that you could... The, a, you don't see much sport where people aren't very good at it, doing it. But also the way you can, even when it's the same man, you can become partisan and you can quickly prefer one of the 
characters to the others or, or support one of the characters, even though it's the same person. So I was very interested in that dichotomy, the com- competition against yourself, the kind of madness, the way that we are two people in lots of ways. It sort of was slightly about, you know, my pre-marriage me and my post-marriage me or my pr- pre-meeting my wife me versus my, my post-meeting my wife me. Um, and the, that competition within yourself. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that podcast. But yeah, no one else is going to commission 110 episodes of that, which there have now been over the over the 10 years. It's, um, I don't do them quite as... I'm starting to do them much more regularly and have done like massive competitions with that. And so, yeah, so the... Rahalastabha, I did an Edinburgh version where I interviewed comedians, I think, first. And just the Collins and thing fell apart. And I kind of wondered whether I could... I'd, I'd sort of realised, again, doing live shows was a way of making some money from them you know that people would pay and come and see us so i wondered if i had a different person every week and we could i could basically carry on with the podcast i've been doing just with with a different guest each time but it turned into more of it you know it just developed into something a bit different than than what i'd anticipated which is great which is what you know i'm really doing on twitch now as well as just workshopping my ideas as i'm doing them and um seeing what comes and by doing that and by doing come back every week and trying something you do create create a a new thing a format develops and so emergency questions came up by accident quite early in relative which then became quite a big part they're sort of less of a big part of it now but they're still there um but that was again an accidental genius thing which a lot of this stuff is so again i when i started podcasting all other comedians were going why are you doing this you're not making any money it's stupid what a waste of time and you know it doesn't look professional it's just you dicking around but I kind of just, it was, none of the money part mattered to me. And, you know, and so accidentally I created an incredible business model that I would have been a genius to have planned ahead, but I didn't plan it in that it, it probably rescued my career in terms of me carrying on working, me working as a stand-up. You know, I wasn't getting much TV work and I wasn't getting many people coming to see me. So doing those podcasts gave my career a new lease of life. Um, and, you know, doing stuff, the Twitch stuff I'm doing now, it's like, okay, this is a way of really hammering home those kind of weird ideas I want to do. Uh, but also I can do Rahul stuff, which is a bit more mainstream. And, you know, and the Ali and Herring's Twitch are fun, which is my thing. I'm doing a ventriloquist dummies at the moment. I kind of feel that, you know, it's, it, I think it's hit the ground running quite, quite well, given I'm not, given I'm just making it up but it feels like it has a lot of potential. So I think that's it, you know, it was just a way of, and and, and it was with Colin Herring, it was with it was just let's give this a go, see what happens. It kind of, um, I guess, appealed to the lazy part of me as well, which was all the sitting down writing stuff is hard. Um, yeah. And so just turning up and messing around for an hour is very appealing to me. I felt like I needed another person to do that, but yeah. I've sort of made myself the other person in most of these things. <laughs> and now able that. to do it alone yeah so and it's interesting you mentioned twitch actually because that even more than podcasts it's a platform that's it's very very popular with young people but not often used by like stand-up comedians like, no. like, like yourself so what what kind of prompted you to start doing streaming is it something that you are finding more enjoyable than the previous way that you would do you know releasing podcasts and being on the radio and doing stand-up shows yeah, well, it's sort of, I talked to Limmy about it and thought he was insane. And last, in sort of December last year, he was saying, I've given up everything and I'm just doing Twitch. And I thought he'd gone mad. Um, especially because he's you know, playing video games for four hours. But it's fun, you know, what he's doing is very funny and inventive and interesting. And you can tune in for a bit and tune out for a bit. Um, and to be honest, I was, we were just sort of thinking, we'd sort of thought, thought about it. And we were thinking about ways of, of trying to live stream the podcasts. So we started this year um, thinking, you know, we've got 20 or 30 live gigs booked in. We'll film them all. Maybe we can pay, because the, the problem was we film all these podcasts and it costs us loads of money to film them and we don't make any money from the videos or we haven't been doing. Yeah. Um, so we thought maybe we could live stream it. We could at least just pay for the filming and then we don't have to keep on asking people through Kickstarter and stuff for money to pay for the filming, which is a, you know, it's a, again, it's a stupid business model, but I'm really glad we have filmed it all because it's nice to have it all on film. Um, so we thought maybe, you know, we talked to Twitch and, and actually I'd done the International um, Women's Day thing where I do the International Wednesday International Men's Day Marathon and we sort of decided to do that and we did that on Twitch and I thought, thought that might be a good way to do it. And so we talked to Twitch about um, maybe coming on and doing a, a channel. So I was thinking, oh, we could, I could play some games. I'll just try it out and see what it's like. Then basically we got into lockdown. So we set, we set up all this equipment that I'm using right now um, to like the weekend before lockdown um realizing i think that we 
you know, we needed to carry on with the podcast. So it enabled us to do that. But then, you know, and then I started doing things like playing football manager and commentating on it a bit, which is sort of like what uh, Bilal Zaffa is doing much more effectively. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I thought I could do the snooker. That would be fun to film the snooker and actually have, you know, so that became like I'd do tournaments and do it two or three nights a week. Um, so I was just, again, I did a thing where I did movie commentaries where people could watch a movie along with me and I would do commentaries over it. So it was just a good way to try out some ideas and see what worked. And then through that, yeah, just it's it sort of developed into think that Ali and Harry, I sort of thought, well, I could start doing something like As It Occurs To Me, which was this sketch show I did, um, especially once we're able to get outside and start filming stuff and have inserts and stuff like that. So I'm still kind of keen to, you know, make more shows, but it's like having your own TV studio. Um, certainly initially, it's again, people can give you free money if they're with Amazon Prime. <laughs> and initially that was, you know, we had a couple of months which were pretty good and paid for all the equipment and, we, gave, we were able to give some money to the comedians fund for comedians and you know it was it was pretty good it's calmed down a little bit but it's still like not it's, it's still like nice to make a bit of money for at no one's expense um but yeah again it's more about the for me the possibilities of it so i just i think there's a few comedians out there have started twigging to it but it's more the ones who are good at improvising like bill alzaffa stevie martin's doing some really good stuff uh limmy obviously um, um ashley story um is doing really well really well with it and there's a few more who've started to do stuff and i think you know i to begin with always, i still was in the mind that it was a gamers platform and then i just sort of realized well no it, it, you know i'm doing rahala on it that's not a gamers thing and it's actually just you, you've got your own tv studio you've got a little thing with buttons here that i can change uh the scenes with and so you know i can press a button and play in something like a sting but that could be a sketch or that could be something i pre-recorded so you suddenly go well this is the chance just to make whatever i want to make on tv without having to leave the house <laughs> so it's been great for lockdown and i think it was a really nice thing to have in lockdown but i think without lockdown it probably wouldn't i mean i yeah. don't think i'd have started doing ali and herring switch of fun without lockdown yeah so th again it's just that's it's just you know, you get opportunities and you try things out and see what happens. And some of them succeed and some of them don't. But I'm much happier. Um, you know, that that was the, even when I started podcasting, there, there was a joke. I just want to be on telly and I want to get back on telly. And there was an element of that to it. But really, the auto again, it goes back to that autonomy, being in perfect control of what you're doing rather than having to put yourself through, um, you know, a committees of people telling you what you can and can't do you know i tried to get a sitcom on tv and the meeting i had with the executives they so everyone else loved it who'd been involved with it, we'd done a little taste to take the person who commissioned loved it they then moved on and the new people just didn't get it you know the things they were suggesting were wrong um and that is their is their power to put it on so you know if i can get to the stage where i'm um doing well enough out of it, and now there is money in it you know and i'm making money from ads on the relistopa but I'm not, we're paying, they're putting that all back into the company and trying to make more interesting things all the time. So it feels like free money, like, and then we're our own production company and it's still not enough to do masses and masses of stuff with. But I think as time goes by, I really wish I was 20 years younger than I am and for lots of reasons. But uh, if I, you know, that's why I think if you're a young person, this is very exciting, I think, because you're able to make your mistakes I think with something like Twitch as well, it's not even, we're putting it up on YouTube, but you, it just disappears as well, which yeah. I think is good because especially if you're young, because you don't want that, you know, I don't want my sketches from 1987 resurfacing and luckily they never will um, <laughs> unless I read them out as I did with one of them the other day. But it's, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's yeah. a great opportunity just to, if you do something every week, so if you play snooker against yourself for 11 years, you'll find out what's funny about that and what's interesting about that or what's, noteworthy about it the you know doing the stones as well the, the stone clearing from the field i just thought there's something in this let's see how it goes and that has developed into this exercise in paranoia and human frailty and more you know the vulnerability death you know yeah. I, as i go around the field i sort of imagine everyone around the field walking their dogs is there to oppose me so you know it's this you know nightmare <laughs> yeah. of a paranoia which is very 2020 you know again i've been yeah. doing it for two or three years it's yeah. very 2020 but yeah. i think there's again it's ad it's the challenge of of talking for 40 minutes for an hour about yeah. nothing is <laughs> you exciting do that very to well me. <laughs> well thank you but you know again and that's how you get better and better at doing it just by doing it yeah. but then the stuff that comes it's it's the creative process 
when you're writing something, you sort of have to get into that state where your brain is semi open to paranoia and weirdness and weird ideas. And it's really hard to get into and it's really hard to write stuff. If you can get into it live on stage or live on a podcast or on a Twitch stream, then you can create some really good stuff. So, you know, I think it's, and, and also your audience is aware that you're, this isn't a scripted show. This is going to be, they're going to find the bits that don't work funny as the bits that don't, which was always the ethos of Rahalister as well, that we kept everything in so you could see where we actually were funny. We didn't snip out the bits where we weren't funny. We left them in. So that you, but also mm. when, you, when I did something like Buzzcocks or um, Have I Got News For You, you record for three hours and then they cut it down and they, le- they lose all the build up to something that becomes, so the best laugh I got on Buzzcocks they'd cut out two or three things that had led up to that, that made it that funny. And so it yeah. doesn't look as funny on TV. Yeah. Um, and also you're aware that things are going to get cut. You can't relax. So yeah. we do sometimes edit bits out of realistic, but only, you know, if we overstepped a mark or someone said something they shouldn't say, really, we don't, we, you know, I let, I leave in the eggy bits. I leave in the bits where I've, where I dry or where I fuck it up. And that's, that's, I think yeah. entertaining, but also make it proves the rest of it is real, <laughs> and I think quite impressive as a result, you know. But it's yeah, so it's I find all that very exciting, and I'm perfectly happy, especially now that I can make some money from it. If I, you know, uh, the, to sit here and and even though I thought Limmy was insane in December last year, here I am in October, <laughs> nearly October this year, and thinking, yeah, no, he's got a point. Maybe mm. I never will go out of the house again. <laughs> so. Um... Uh, yeah, so you are uh, set to appear on the next series of Taskmaster That's as a true. result of your your multiple public appeals and requests for them to let you on. <laughs> so was it was it as I'm guessing that that was something you really really wanted to do, as from the fact that you said it was. Was it as fun yeah? To be well, on you know, I, I think I knew I knew I'd be. Um, I, I thought I'd be good on it. I'm, I don't think I was as good as I thought I would be on it, like in entertainment value. Um, I thought it was right up my street because it's that pedanticness, and you know, I'm competitive, so I think yeah. that certainly comes across. Yeah. Um, so it's fun to watch me fail because I really want to win. Yeah, um, and, that's interesting because uh, I thought because you're a large part of your career has been demonstrating very impressive levels of commitment to some you know really quite sort of bizarre tasks. You know, like growing yeah. a, a toothbrush moustache for a full year, yeah. playing yourself at snooker an infinite amount of times. So it sounds sounds like it would make you the perfect contestant on Taskmaster. Well, maybe I, you know it's hard for me to judge. Well, I, I would certainly not call myself the perfect contestant because I was surprised how down the line I was. It's, in the heat of the moment, you don't have any time to think about it. You don't, you know, and you're you're nervous and you've just got to go with your first instinct. And yeah, lots of them are funny. Honestly, lots of them are funny because they're bad and wrong. And uh, sometimes I did had came up with a good idea, but I wasn't as inventive as I thought I'd be. I thought I'd either be very funny or very inventive, and yeah. I was surprised at how literally i how literal i was i think with the tasks um but i was trying you know but i was also trying to win them so but it didn't matter because you need someone like that when you've got other people who are being more flamboyant or weird or you know and and actually within our group i think everyone was had one that they were just brilliant at that they were and, and and lots that they were left field on and sometimes i was left field and sometimes it was fine i'm sure i, I think uh, it was honestly recording the studios i mean certainly coming out of lockdown uh, to go to a studio with you know some of the funniest people in the country uh, the first day we recorded the first two shows and I cried laughing pretty much all day and it was the most cathartic thing that I've ever experienced just if, if that was all that I got out of it it would be worth it because I came out feeling so like reborn from the tears of laughter and shame that I would I had, spread, had shared so it was so much fun and doing the task is so you know it's ridiculous to go and to do this job I mean call it a job and get paid it's ridiculous I get nicely paid to do something that is the most fun in the world you know if you could do that as your job you would think this is this is just awesome so sometimes it's humiliating because you fuck up but uh, but then also you know that's that's good value but Greg and Alex are so funny yeah. and so good at the show and so we were we did it without an audience and everyone was a bit worried about how that would affect things but it didn't i don't think if anything i think it just gave us more freedom to and more room uh, i don't know how they edited it down but it was it was you know absolutely terrific fun to do it so i really enjoyed it yeah and it was and i think it's the best show on tv at the moment and certainly the best show of that kind of show and uh yeah it's just great to I, you know i sort of feel like i've done i almost feel like i've done that you know maybe that's enough now maybe i'll just spend a bit more time and it, it, it almost makes me because i don't I, it's 
it's hard to think of anything that would be as much fun to do and yeah. there's no pressure on you you don't have to do any work really most tv shows if you were doing 10 episodes or something you'd have to do a lot of work but there's no prep allowed or you know apart from bringing what you're going to bring in is the first yeah. round which yeah. i was very lackadaisical about <laughs> as it turns out. um and uh uh, so yeah, you know, it, it'll be hard to think of a job that would be that much fun, uh, on TV. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. It's sort of, it's sort of, yeah, it would be interesting. It feels like a good t place to bow out, but I'm sure I won't, but, uh, but no, it just, <laughs> well, I'll carry on doing my own stuff, but it just, you yeah, know, yeah, it, yeah. It just, you don't necessarily, uh, you know, it, the more I go on the TV is like, it, even that, I wonder how many people who don't know what Taskmaster are, is are going to watch it, even now it's on Channel 4. I mean, I, th I think it will definitely get a bigger audience. But it's yeah. not... People don't watch TV in the way they used to. So if, in the old days, if you're on Channel 4, you know, 4 million people, five, 6 million people would have just watched it regardless of who, whether they wanted to or not. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and now I think you have to seek out. I think it's the kind of show people will seek out. And it, it's yeah. very, very, very funny. Yeah. Um, and I can't really take much of the credit for that but uh, it's a fantastic group of people and it's really and it's very exciting as well i think it's a very exciting contest so um uh i think people are going to enjoy it but uh, probably not as much as i did <laughs> right um so on to on, on to your book which is uh, going to come out on the 5th of november i believe yeah um so that's the problem with men when is it international men's day so i'm aware that the answer to this question is going to be quite gargantuan so in 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 two minutes or less, could you briefly explain for those who don't know much about your book, what is the problem with men and how does it pertain to International Men's Day? Well, I you know, I've been doing this thing for uh, uh, about, again, about 10 years, what, where on International Women's Day, I find everyone who's asking when's International Men's Day as if there would never be one and often say there would never be one and then telling them that there is one and it's November the 19th. Uh, and, you know, thousands of people do it every, every International Women's Day. And so it's this... It's a it's again another one of these pedantic and grand kind of you know me just digging my feet in, but also I think it's funny because they're so it's you make them look stupid by re revealing that their joke doesn't work. You make them look stupid by revealing that everyone has thought of the same joke and they still can't bother to Google it. But then you make yourself look I make myself look stupid because of my inability to let it go and be like King Canute trying to turn back a tide that I can't turn back. And so it's I think it's a really lovely comedic conceit. But I started thinking about the implications of it. It seems just like a funny thing to do. You know, people go, oh, political greatness has gone mad. You wouldn't be allowed in International Men's Day. You aren't, there is one. But why do men only talk about it on International Women's Day? If they put the effort they put into International Women's Day on International Men's Day, it'd be the biggest fucking day on the planet. Um, and why don't they care about International Men's Day when they seem, when they, they profess to care about it? They go, yeah, but no one covers it. You go, well, you know, you've, you've, got, you've got to do it. Uh, so it's this, but also it sort of is a little seed of, I think, what's gone wrong with the world, which is this um, this sort of knee-jerk reaction to political correctness and things like this, and seeing injustice when the injustice is the other way. So it's uh, in the book I talk about being the soft drug that leads to all lives matter, um, which is, you know, fucking ridiculous that people are so stupid they can't understand what Back Lives Matter is about and that yeah. they're trying to profess that, in fact, they is the, they're the slighted ones. And it's about, uh, I suppose, us coming to a point in history where that may, things are changing and are hopefully changing for the better, but there's this knee-jerk reaction that we're seeing and this last spasm, I would hope, but it might be a big, long last spasm of a, an old order being replaced by something a bit better, I hope. It could be an old order being replaced by something a lot worse, but we'll see. But, yeah. you know, so it's about trying to look at why men do that and why, why men aren't celebrating International Men's Day in the correct way and why they get chippy. And yeah. if there's any way we can, you know, it's quite a short and lighthearted book. It's really a comedic book. Um, yeah. But there, I think because I wrote it during the, the lockdown, the Black Lives Matter thing really brought into it. The, co the response to COVID actually that the male leaders were very aggressive and treated like a war and the female leaders generally speaking treated it like a, a pandemic <laughs> that needed to be yeah. addressed and did uh, in the short term at least seem to have done better at controlling things so uh, you know it's interesting this toxic it's not exactly toxic masculinity but it's about this overconfidence of men yeah and this self-defeat of men you know i think men are just de uh, their their opposition to feminism which comes from an idea that feminism 
is about women gaining, uh, you know, attacking men or gaining superiority, which it isn't. It's yeah. about trying to create an equal society, which would yeah. benefit men. So all the men play, being upset about International Women's Day don't understand that International Women's Day and International Men's Day are doing the same job, which is trying to make the the le- the playing field level. As it turns out, I think women have more to do than men do, but there are things that that where men are badly affected. But men also are the only people in the world, I think, who have a negative stereotype that they perpetuate themselves yeah. and sort of join in with. Yeah. And I think if it's just trying to... You know, in a very small way, I'm not a perfect man. I've done lots of un-PC things, which I think is why it made me the good person to do this. I'm not doing it from a virtue signaling right on perspective. I'm doing it from a comedic perspective. Yeah. But um, I think within that day and within that reaction to the day, there is a there is a seed which explains all that's happened the last 10 years. And when I started doing it, it was I've st- I'm going to stop doing it because I think the the landscape has changed so much and it's actually too uh, mentally damaging for me to uh, carry on doing it. And we'll see how, we'll see how the, the book yeah. coming out is, uh, we'll see what I have to deal with with that. But yeah. I, I'm hoping it's, it's just, a, it's actually a way of trying to direct men towards International Men's Day and make International yeah. Men's Day uh, stand for what it originally was put together for, which wasn't um, uh, as a reaction to women and it wasn't as a reaction even to mental illness and suicide it was a, about trying to celebrate the good things men do which i think we need to start redefining masculinity a little bit and uh, and looking at good men and rather than celebrating overconfident orange idiots yeah definitely and it's, it's interesting that you kind of you i guess you're in an interesting position as a comedian who's speaking out about sexism because sexism and comedy is quite a big issue isn't it? i mean even if we yeah. just take the example of Taskmaster, which is making some progress, but each of the first three series had only one female contestant, and in sure. each of the first eight series, there was a majority of male contestants. Is this yeah. something that comedians are sort of aware of and open about, and are there any ideas how to solve it? Yeah, it's definitely being addressed, and it's way, way, way better than it was, like even the last two or three years. Uh, but yeah, so I think even when Taskmaster started, it wasn't, you know, and beyond that, um, you know, representation for an equal representation or proportionate representation for ethnic and uh, disabled comedians and all that, and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, it is something that I think is re- I think things, there's a massive sea change and the, and the industry has a lot of, uh, a lot of problems within it uh, that need addressing and a lot of sexism within it. And it was a very boys clubby atmosphere. The live circuit was a very sexist and uh, sexually aggressive and uh, unpleasant place for women to be. And I think it is changing. I think there's a, the, the, of the newer comedians coming through, I think I would say it's more than 50% of the good new comedians are women, but certainly there's a big load of fantastic female comedians coming through. It takes a long time to become a good comedian and they're sort of comedians in their 30s and 40s now who are getting to the point where they're getting onto TV, but it's much more balanced. So yeah, you'll see, I mean, it's the radio's done better. I think you'll see on radio, you'll see panel shows with one man and four women now, yeah. which is is good. I think, but you know, it'd be good to just get parity. But um, I think people are, are are aware of it and are trying to change that. And I think Taskmaster equally are. They are in a position where they, I think, part of the reason it's taken me so long to get on it because they've always wanted me to be on it because they recognise that I'm a, a good person. Is that they can only have a certain amount of (laughs) white middle-class middle-aged men on there. There's one, you know, there's sort of two this time because of Johnny, but, um, but yeah, I think they know that they have to do a better job. Um, and some are doing better than others. Uh, and, but you know, I've been pushing for it and, and with my podcast as well, I, it wasn't something until two or three years ago that I really started going, okay, no, I, I, I'm being, I'm criticizing the TV shows for not having more women on, but then I looked at my own guests and it was, you know, again, not 50, 50. So yeah. since then I've made uh, an effort to make my guests on my podcast as close to 50, 50 as possible. It's difficult because again, I, you know, the, the problem, it, the problem is that the audience also needs to back this idea. So if I have a female, when I'm, when it, certainly for myself, I, you know, I depend on the ticket money for myself. That's how I get paid. If every time I put a female comedian on, I sell a hundred tickets rather than 300 tickets, then that massively impacts the whole the whole process but having said that you can still make that work and there are there are lots of comedian female comedians who um who can do that job as well so but it's it's about all of us making the efforts to move things on make it a more comfortable and safe place for women to be 
Um, and it's good for us all, you know, writers rooms I've noticed used to be all men and used to be all the same kind of men, you know, and I probably have benefited from this through my, throughout my career. Um, and now the last writing writers room I was in was, was possibly one more woman than men, but certainly 50, 50. Uh, and the show is better as a result because, you know, you want, you want all the life experience you can get in if you have, 10 men who are all like not probably married and <laughs> single and and spend each night watching sci-fi and eating pizza you'll get the same jokes from 10 people so why yeah. not have you know some married people some older yeah. people some younger people some people who come from poorer backgrounds um you know and so yeah it's crazy not to have so i, I think things are changing but yeah absolutely you're absolutely right to to point it out um i think you know i think my efforts to have uh, female guests over the last three years, I think, prove how many potential funny female comedians there are. So, you know, I think they've all... The danger is with Rahala Spirit, it's a very difficult show to come into if you're not a good comedian, you know, if you're not a good and experienced comedian. And very occasionally I'll have someone on a little bit too early in their career, male or female, who's just broken through or who I'm interested in. And it's quite a difficult job to talk for an hour in front of an audience in front with, with someone who you know is an established comedian not not everyone can do it i don't but i don't think there have been many disasters and i think there have been a lot of very very strong um and i for me i like it more i kind of i like talking to women it kind of i think it's a more enjoyable chat and it's a different kind of chat and again it's the variety of experience so it's possible to do it and i hope and i, I think it's happening but yeah well done for spotting it but you're a man so what are you gonna do about that well yeah yeah and I'll, i'm a I'll, man look like, this is terrible what we're we gonna do there are no women in the <laughs> it's <disgraceful>. yeah um <laughs> cool well you're a very good man so um I'll, I'll i'll let you get on get thank on you. get on with your day but um thank you very much for your time um Thanks, and I, I look forward to watching you in the next series of taskmaster whenever that it's comes a, out it's a lot of fun i think it's starting fairly imminently in the next two or three weeks i haven't been given a date but i think it starts pretty soon Excellent. I think it's over by Christmas. There are 10 weeks, so I think it's got yeah. to start quite soon. Wonderful. And I will, I, will, I will buy your book and tell everyone else to buy your book. Thank you. Yes, good. Give it, cool. tell, tell all the men to buy it. Good. All right, <laughs> mate. Cheers. Thank you. There, they don't need to. No, they can, <laughs> they, they'll enjoy it. All right, cheers. All right, bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>